um, all of these families, Lord, that have brought these children. I thank you for um, an opportunity to uh, show the difference between being obedient and disobedient, Lord. I pray that you help us to be obedient this, um, this week, Lord. Help us each day, Lord, to, um, to show your, um, your grace and your mercy to the people around us, Lord. Help us to um, have joy in our homes because of you, Lord. We love you, Lord, and we trust you, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Grab your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And this morning, we're going to talk about branding. Not like cattle branding, but like corporate branding. I've always been uh, fascinated by sort of corporations that have a really strong brand. There are certain, certain elements that are singular identifiers of corporate structure and corporate value and something as simple as like a logo communicates much more than this tiny little picture. It tells you all that you need to know and all that you you want about that. Take take Apple, for example. Like I'm all in on Apple's ecosystem. Like I just gave in a long time ago. Everything I own is is a Mac product, Apple product or whatever. Uh, And so when you see the little Apple, the little logo, it's communicating something about the corporate values, right? And, and Apple's branding is, is different. Its marketing's different. They're not like every other computer company. They're not trying to sell you, you know, a, an affordable, well-built laptop or whatever. They say, we think you're different. We think you're special. We don't think you think like everybody else. We think you're creative. And so we've dev- designed products for you. And it's the world's strongest brand today. It's the same thing with a company like Amazon. You see their logo, it communicates what the company is about, right? It's A to Z. It's the little, the little arrow at the bottom of the Amazon logo. And so when you see it, you're like, well, they, they got everything we need. It's a one-stop shop for all of our needs. There's, there's singular identifiers of a corporate brand. It's positive. It can also be negative. Uh, take Bud Light, for example. Right? That, their study, their case is going to be taught in business schools for generations of how to destroy a brand. And it's because they, they got out of alignment with the core values, right? And so you have this corporate branding structure that's communicating more about the organization than just the simple logo. And so the question is, what's the church's brand? Or what should the brand be? Well, that's what you get into in Ephesians chapter 5. It's love. Love should be the defining core characteristic of God's church. It should be a singular identifier. When people encounter biblically grounded love, they order immediately associate it with the church. Unfortunately, I think the church has got a little bit of a branding problem. Uh, when I was in seminary, we had a, a project we had to go and we had to interview a certain number of people and ask all these questions and stuff. And so I went and hung out at Starbucks and I would ask people. And one of the questions was, you know, what do you think of when you think of the, 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 the church? Uh, they're judgy, out of touch, money hungry. You get all these different answers that don't have anything to do with what God intends for the church to be. 
And so that's what we're going to be looking at this morning in, in Ephesians chapter 5. I want you to understand this. We need to walk in love. Love one another. That is to be the defining characteristic of the church because it is the, the, the defining characteristic of the Father. Love is what should be communicated. Now when we get to Ephesians chapter 5, if you remember last week we made a pivot. When you're studying through the book of Ephesians, the first three chapters are about our positional understanding. They're very doctrinal. They're very heady. They're, they're, they're very heavy to deal with in some instances. But when you get to Ephesians chapter 4, it, it turns the page. And it's not your positional understanding, it's your practical application. And so based on who God is, what God has done for us, who we are in Christ, this is how we should act. In Ephesians chapter 4, we saw that we all have a personal role in it, to be humble and gentle, patient and restrained. So we have a personal role in being the church. We have a corporate structure in being the church. God gives us gifts that teach us how to be the church. And then we have collective responsibilities as the church. There are certain things that we must do and must not do. And then in chapter 5, you get into what the church is supposed to be, what is supposed to be the defining characteristic of God's people, and it's love. And there's going to be five movements in the text, and we're going to be wildly ambitious this morning. I don't think there's any way that I'm going to get all the way through the text, but I will outline the whole thing for you because we're going to try to get a chapter and a half this morning because it's all one big idea. But the first movement in the text is the plea. The plea. There's an appeal here. There's a, there's a plea here. And the plea is in chapter 5, verse 1. This is what Paul writes. He says, Therefore, be imitators of God... As beloved children and walk in love. Paul is saying if you are going to be the church, then you must imitate the Lord. You must be an imitator of God. Because that's the only way that the church is going to be what God's designed it to be. God has a big design for the church. And God's design for the church is that people would have immediate access to the character of Christ, just like they did in the Gospels. That's the purpose of spiritual gifts. All of the gifts are at their fullest in Christ, and all of them are operational in Christ. Like you and I, we have a gift. Jesus had all the gifts, and all the gifts were at their fullest in him. I mean, he had the gift of preaching, and he was the greatest preacher of all time. He had the gift of evangelism. He's the greatest evangelist of all time. He had the gift of healing. He's the greatest healer of all time. He has them all, and they're all at their fullness in him, and then he gives part of himself to the church. And I have a gift, and you have a gift, and everybody in the room that's a blood-bought, born-again believer, we all have a gift. And so when we all come together and our gifts are operating in unison, in max capacity, then we have the character of Christ in the church. And that's why Paul says, be imitators of God. Be imitators of God. The word for imitate there, it's, it's, the, it's the Greek word mimetes. It's where we get our word for mimic. We're supposed to mimic the Father as the church. And to do that, we have to walk in love. Love is the defining characteristic of God. We know that God is God. Because God loves. It says in 1 John that God is love. Whenever we experience love, genuine love, whether it's in your home, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in the church, wherever you are, whenever you have a, an experience with love, you are experiencing the essence of the character of God. It is the defining quality. God is Love, and we're supposed to imitate that, and it should be one of the most natural things in the world for, for God's children to mimic his love. Because it says right there, as, as beloved children, children imitate their parents. They mimitate, mimic their parents. It's, it's sort of a natural inclination that they have. Um, when I was growing up, I was a huge Braves fan. Loved the Braves, man. And, and I loved the Braves so much because of my grandmother. Every night, every night, at 5.30, we'd watch wrestling, right? And it was the old NWA stuff, man. It was, it was Arn Anderson. Boy, I hated Arn Anderson and the Four Horsemen and Ricky Steamboat and Ric Flair. Woo, right? 
Every night I watched wrestling my grandmother. And then at 6.05, we watched the Braves. Best memories I had growing up as a kid. And because I was such a big Braves fan, I had a, a favorite player. I love Chipper. Love Chipper Jones. I dress like him, act like him. I, I try to pattern my game after him. I love Chipper. But Chipper wasn't his name. Your Braves fan, his name was Larry Jones Jr. The Mets used to yell it at him. The reason they called him Chipper is because he was a chip off his old block. Parents or children imitate their parents. It's frightening how much like me Josiah is. Like, I feel bad for Alicia. He thinks like me, acts like me, and I get so mad because I know what he's thinking. She don't have a clue, and so she's kind of like out. She don't have to worry about it as much. But it's like children imitate their parents. And the quality that we're supposed to imitate is God's love. And so you see the plea, be imitators of God. And then you see the pattern, because that's kind of a difficult concept, right? It's this big ethereal thing to imitate God's love. Well, what is God's love? And then you get the pattern of God's love in the second part of verse 2. It says, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. A fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So there you see the pattern for love. And biblical love, Christian love, is not the same thing as worldly love. There's, there's an idea of what, of what love is in the world. And it's just all gooey, gooey, lovey-dovey nonsense. Like, that's not, that's not love. When, when Alicia and I were dating, we were been married 15 years this past Wednesday. Bless her heart. We dated two years before that. And when we were dating, I was we, we were disgusting. And don't, don't judge me. You know, y'all were the same way. Like, we would we'd go out on a date. We would go dinner and a movie, and I'd drive home. And I had, like, this hour, hour-long drive home. And I would get home, and the first thing I had to do, I had to call her, right? But why? Like, nothing happened on the drive home. What in the world are we going to talk about? I call her, and I say, oh, baby, I love you so much. And, mm, right? Like, that's not love. That's affection. That's an emotion. Love is not an emotion. Love is a noun, or rather, love is a verb. Love is always doing. Love is always moving. Love is always giving itself away for the benefit of someone else. Love is a verb, not an emotion. It's not a feeling. Specifically, it's, it's, it's the action of sacrificially meeting somebody else's need. Genuine love joyfully gives itself away. How do we know that God loves us? Well, John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son. How do we know that Jesus loves us? As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, in the love chapter, he tells all the things that love is always doing. He says love does not seek its own interests. Love, genuine love, biblical love, is always about the business of, of the interest of others, of meeting their needs, of elevating them, of investing in them. Love wants what's best for somebody else. And when we understand that, it makes living the Christian life a lot easier. Because I'm going to be real honest, I struggle with this. Because you're supposed to love your neighbor, right? Well, how in the devil am I supposed to do it? I don't even like most people. And most people don't like me, right? How do you love them? Well, love's a choice you make. We don't have to get along with everybody. We don't have to have affection for everybody. But if we're going to imitate God's love, then we need to be about the business of sacrificially serving other people. Love one another. And so you see the plea and you see the pattern. And because this is such a difficult concept, Paul gives us the negative example of it. We get a positive example of love when we look at Jesus. We get the negative example of love in in the next few verses. And so the third movement of the text begins in verse 3 and it's the perversion. It's, it's, an, it's an upside down love. It's an inside out love. It's a backwards love. It's a carnal love. There's, a, there's a, a perverted type of love that is not the biblical type of love. And, and it really comes in two forms. It comes in this narcissistic love. It's a self love. And it comes in this permissive love. And we see both of them here in the text. In verse 3 you get a glimpse of, of this narcissistic love. 
It says, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. This is a narcissistic self-love. So we get the pattern of this sacrificial love that gives and gives and gives. And then you get this narcissistic love that takes and takes and takes. Sexual immorality is not interested in giving away. It's interested in taking. It's not interested in the benefit of the other. It's, it's, it's interested in using the other for the benefit of yourself, for your own gratification, your own desires. It's the same thing with covetousness. Covetousness is not about giving away. Covetousness is about, it's about taking. It's, it's a self-love. Covetousness at its heart is idolatry. It's all about what you want and what you desire, and it's this narcissistic you know, self-absorbed, self-consumed love. And the end result of that is judgment. It's verse 5. For you may be sure of this, that anyone or everyone who is sexually immoral or, um, sexually immoral or impure or who is covetousness, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. And so you have this narcissistic self-love that brings the judgment of God. Self-love is, is not biblical love. Giving itself away for the betterment of somebody else, that's biblical love. And that's the first kind of form of, of perversion of love. And then the second form of, of this perverted love is, is a permissive love. Love doesn't just ignore everything. Like, that's kind of the world's idea. Well, if you love me, you'll just let me do whatever you want me to do. Love is interested in the, in the best interest of somebody else. If you love your children, you're not going to let them do certain things because you love them. And so there's, there's, there's no type of permissive love. It's another form of corruptive love that the church has to really be on guard against. You see it in verse 6. It says, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience, verse 7, therefore do not become partners with them. What, what we're being warned against there is this permissive love that just lets everything in the church. There are some denominations going down this road. There are some churches going down this road. This permissive love of you just do you and, and we'll do us and God loves everybody and it's all okay. It's a permissive love that is a perversion of true, genuine love. But how we love is the clearest and best evidence of the genuine nature of your faith. John 13, 35 says this. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. By this, everybody's going to know, the whole world will know, if you love one another. Our love, the church's love, is the demonstration to the world that we are disciples of Jesus. And it can't be narcissistic and it can't be permissive. There has to be guardrails on it because God desires for his church to be pure and holy. And, and if we're going to be a reflection of the glory of Jesus, then we all have to have the same operational gifts working together so that they can know Christ. And we're way too, far, too, too quick, I think, to affirm people in their salvation. I, I, I look. I'm all in. I once saved, always saved. Like you didn't start it. You didn't finish it. God did that, and I am convinced that He's the author and perfecter of our faith. If your faith is real, then you are really saved, and you can't lose it. There's nothing you can do. Where I always hammer the nail when I counsel with people is like, even though that's true, you don't get to have assurance of it until you have demonstrated the nature of your faith over time. I used to have uh, um, a new members class and a new, new believers class, and I, we would talk about this, and we would go over you know, the perseverance of the saints and what saved, always saved, and we would go through all that, and I would say, look, now if in six months you're not here and you're out living like the world, I'm going to come knock on your door and you're going to remember this conversation. I can't tell me how many times I would knock on the door and they would open. I'm standing there, they hang their heads and say, Brother Josh, I know. I know. Do you know what percentage of people in Southern Baptist churches are here 
one year after they profess Jesus. So 12 months. They come forward, they pray a prayer, they get baptized. 20%. 80% of people give no evidence that they're actually saved. They don't love like this. By this, people will know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. And so verse 6 then is, and is an, um, an admonishment to guard the church's purity against false professors. And these things will happen. It's inevitable. The apostles couldn't stop it. You go over to Acts chapter 5, very early in the church, you get Ananias and Sapphira. right? They come in and they lie to the Holy Spirit and God kills them. And you kind of read your text, you're like, man, that escalated quickly. Why did God do it like that? Because the church was, when it was in its sort of embryonic state and he couldn't allow that type of impurity to exist or it would have corrupted the rest of the church. And so we can't have this perverted, permissive love that ends in corruption. One of the sweetest ladies I've ever met, her name was Miss Osi. And I loved Miss Osi. She was a widow in, in Wayne County when I was a deacon. And we used to care for Miss Osi. And I would go over there about once a month. I would just sit with Miss Osi. I loved her. And she loved my children. Uh, but Miss Osi, she had five kids. And she was an enabler. And all five of her kids wound up on drugs. All five of her kids wound up in prison. And all. That's what permissive love leads to. It leads to corruption. And so we have to be on guard against this sort of perverted love. And so you see the perversion there, and then, then you get the prescription, because what do we do about it? How do we love like Jesus? How do we have this sacrificial love? What's the, what's the prescription for that? What's, what's the cure for that? If we're going to be imitators of God and love like Jesus, what should it look like? And number one, I would say we have to expose evil. Verse 13 of chapter 5. But with anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. So we have to expose evil in the church. And sometimes you do that on the front end. Sometimes you do it on the back end. Sometimes you have to exercise church discipline, which is a, a biblical thing. And we all like, ah, oh, man, church discipline, that's awful. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody exercises that. But I'll tell you this. I've never had a negative outcome when I follow biblical prescription concerning church discipline. Because we don't do it to be mean. We do it to return somebody to faith. I had, I had a... A guy one time, uh, about 10 years before I got to Brewston, the church had a split. And uh, it got pretty ugly. Deacons got in a fist fight in a Wednesday night business meeting. Like, it was ugly. Chairman of the deacons at that point, his name was Dan. And Dan led the faction that left the church. And so about 10 years later, I'm there. And I'd been at Brewston maybe three or four months. And one of the deacons came to me and he said, hey, listen, you need to be aware of this. And Dan and his wife, Jenna, they're, they're trying to come back to the church and they're singing and they're practicing with the choir to sing in the Christmas cantata and the people ain't going to have that. I said, all right, no problem, I'll handle it. And so I called Dan and I said, hey, man, I'd like to talk to you. And so Dan comes by my office one night after he got off work. Man, just guns blazing. He walks in the office just hot, man. He's like, I ain't apologizing to nobody about nothing. I didn't do nothing wrong and I ain't going to apologize. And I was like, I appreciate you, Dan. I just we're going to have a conversation, but uh, that's fine. I just want you to know we love you, and you're always welcome to come back, but there's a right way and a wrong way to do it, and we're going to do it the right way. And he left. A couple of little things happened over the next few months, and then one, one day his, his wife, Jenna, and her mama showed up in my office during the day, and she was hot, and she said, ah, we're coming back, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and I don't care who says what. Who do you think you are going to tell us what we're going to do? And I said, let me stop you right there, because I can match energies with anybody. I said, I'm going to tell you who I am. I'm the pastor, and my job is to guard the church against people like you, and you ain't coming back till you come back right. Amen. I said, get out of my office. She was mad, boys, fired up. Didn't hear anything about it for probably six months. One morning I preached, and I gave the invitation. And I look up, and here comes Dan down the aisle. Now, last time that man was in the sanctuary, he had a fist fight. I'm like, oh, Lord, I'm going to have to throw hands in front of the church. I don't know what's going on. My, my security stood up. My kind of, I got I backed him down, you know. And uh, Dan come up front, and he fell on me, and he wrapped his arms around me, and he just started bawling his eyes out. And he said, Brother Josh, he said, the Holy Spirit has convicted me. I haven't slept in weeks. What I did to this church was wrong, and I need to publicly repent. And I gave Dan a microphone, and he told his story. 
and the deacons that were there, they all come in. They were all crying. The church was crying. They prayed together at the altar. And, and after the service, I took Dan and Jenna back because I knew their life. It was a small town, and they didn't give evidence of it. We went through First John. And both of them sat back there and started crying again. They said, Brother Josh, I've never heard the gospel like this. I said, we've never been saved. So they prayed to receive Jesus. And when I went to baptize them, you know what Dan told the church? He told if it wasn't for me and my unwillingness to accept his sin, that his whole family would have went to hell for it. We expose evil. We expose sin. Because we're interested in what's best. And I kid you not, that deacon that got in a fist fight on a business meeting floor, him and his wife, two best church members I ever had. I love them. To this day, I love them. We expose evil. It's necessary. It's not judgy. It's not harsh. If we desire what's best for somebody, then we have to confront certain things. So we expose evil. Number two, we live with urgency. Verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as wise, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time because the days are evil. And so what's the prescription to love like Jesus? Well, well Jesus ain't going to tolerate sin, and he also lived with some urgency. Jesus accomplished more than three years than anybody else has in 3,000. Like Jesus was a man on a mission. And I'm of the mindset that hell's real, it's really hot, and people are really going, and I want to stop it. We got to live with urgency. We got to love with urgency. Time is of the essence. We want people to know that God's love is a forgiving love. We can look around, and, and by comparison, we're probably better than most. I'm better than most people. Most people ain't the standard. God's the standard. And either we're perfect or we're not. And if we're not, then we get death, hell, and judgment. And that's where everybody's resting. Unless they know and experience the forgiving love of God. People are lost, they're dying, they're going to hell. And friend, I want you to understand this. Time is of the essence. Church member, time is of the essence. We have to love with urgency. And maybe you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus. Time is of the essence. The Bible says, behold, now is the time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. If you've never experienced this forgiving love of God, then give your life to Jesus today. Let today be the day. If we're going to love like Jesus, then we're going to expose evil we're going to live with urgency. We're going to be surrendered to the Spirit. Verse 17 says, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. The vast majority of problems in the church happen because people are walking in the flesh and not in the Spirit. The reason there's such a negative view of the church and the society is, is because... Because you have a choice. You can be yielded to the Spirit or you can be yielded to the flesh. And all too often we have this carnal love, this self-love. We're interested in our own wants and our own desires and our own pride and our own pain. And we mistreat people. And they get a skewed view of Jesus for it. So we're going to love like Jesus. Then we have to be fully yielded to the Spirit. Because I'm going to tell you right now, some people can't be loved apart from the Spirit. Oh, but man. When you see them the way Jesus sees them, you can sacrifice anything. Because without our sacrifice, they're lost. So we have to be filled with the Spirit, surrendered to the Spirit. Number four, how do we love like Jesus? The prescription, be surrendered to one another. Chapter 5, verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So not only do we have to be surrendered to the Spirit, we've got to be surrendered to one another. And that ain't easy either. And that can come from one of two places. It can come from the pulpit down. I love preaching happy sermons. I love preaching encouraging sermons. I love talking about heaven. I love it. But every now and then, if you're going to preach the whole counsel of God, you're going to come across a text that's difficult. Are you going to be surrendered to the Word? Are you going to, are you going to get offended by the Word? Are you going to bring your life in into conformity with the word. 
be surrendered. It can come from the pulpit down. And it can come across the aisles. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, if they love you and they want what's best for you, and you get a little out of line, they have a moral and ethical obligation to confront that. Matthew chapter 18. They just come to you and say, hey, I see what you're doing. I don't think it's good for you. I don't think it's good for your family. And it's hard to receive that. But you have to understand that they love you. And there had to be an investment made there. There are certain people that I will allow to speak truth into my life and others that I won't. When I was growing up, I grew up with a girl. Her name was Leah. And I, I love Leah. We were literally in the nursery together at church. I knew Leah my whole life. We went to x-ray school together. And because I'd known Leah so long, like she could make jokes and she could, she could poke fun at me. And she could say the things to me that nobody else could say. Well, one night we went, to, we were working at a hospital together in clinic. And she was joking around with me about something. I was joking with her. And all these other people that I didn't know, they decided they got jokes too. And they're going to crack them jokes. Well, that went over about as well as you think. Because I was like, I don't know who you think you are. You don't know me. She has the right to say that. You don't. She put in the time to know me and love me my whole life. The people in this room, they know you. They love you. And so be surrendered to that love. Because ultimately, that's the way Jesus loves us. And this idea of surrender is so important that you get three pictures of what it looks like. It's chapter 5, verses 29 through 33, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, and chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. Those are the pictures. What's the fifth movement of this text? We're talking about love. And the first one is husbands and wives. The second one is children and parents. And the third one is bond servants and masters. And so if we're going to love like Jesus, then we're going to have to be surrendered to one another. Like these are not just random. Like people will pull this out and talk about this is a marriage text and it does talk about marriage. But primarily it's saying that marriage is to be an illustration of the way Jesus loved us. When guys would come to me for marriage counseling, man, I'll tell you, I didn't do a lot of it because I was ruthless on the guy. Because you come in, that woman's not submitting. I said, well, you're not loving her the way Jesus said to. It is said. Love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Christ gave everything away. And here you are, you're complaining that she's nagging you because you won't pick up your dirty clothes. We're just give everything away. It's a mutual surrender. Christ gave everything to us and we give everything back to him. Same thing with parents and children. There's instructions for, for children in here to obey your parents, but then it turns right around and gives instructions to the parents. Don't provoke your children to wrath. Give it away. It's a mutual submission. You see it with slaves and masters. There, there, there's, there's instructions for the slaves and instructions for the masters. It's not one sort of hierarchy, authority thing. It's a picture of the love of Jesus and the way that we love him. He gives everything for us and we give everything back to him. How can we not? How can we not love like that? There's, there's a Bible word for this type of love. This type of surrendered love. It's repentance. This is how we come to saving faith. We come to Jesus and we say, I will give up everything for you. And we joyfully give it all away. We're like, we're like the, the man who found a pearl of great price. And he, went and he sold everything just so he could have it. That's Jesus. I will give up my entire life for you, Jesus, because you gave up your entire life for me. That's the love of the church. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. We all have the judgment of God on us. Romans 10.9 says there's none righteous. There's none who's even seeking him. But glory to God, Romans 10 says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It's the glory of the gospel. We come and we trade all that we are for all that he is. That's love. That's love. And that's the church's brand. If the church is known 
for VBS, as great as VBS is, then we're not imitators of God. If the church is known for bickering and infighting, then we're certainly not imitators of God. If the church is known by anything else, we're not imitating. Paul says, be imitators of God and walk in love. By this, the world will know that you're my disciples. And so this morning, I want you to take a look at your heart. What do you love? If you're here this morning and you say, Brother Josh, I don't love Jesus. Not like that. I've not given everything to him. I've not surrendered all that I am to him. Then let today be the day. Friend, come and pray and receive your salvation. And experience this forgiving love. It's there. It's available. If you need that today, I want to invite you to come. Believer, if you're here, maybe you'd say, you know what? I don't always love like that. Maybe we need to ask for forgiveness. Because God's got big design for this church. If we want God's best, then we're going to have to love like this. And so I'm going to pray for us, and I'm going to invite you to come. Father God, we thank you so much that you are love. Love is the defining characteristic of your character. The Bible says God is love, and Lord, I I pray that we will experience that love in a fresh and a new way. Lord, forgive us when we, we sort of corrupt it into this carnal love, this narcissistic love, this permissive love. Lord, help us to follow the pattern that Jesus set and love like Jesus. And Lord, I pray this morning for anybody in this room who's never experienced that love. Lord, I pray that today is the day where they understand the forgiving nature of your love. It's not a permissive love. You don't just ignore our sin. You, you judge our sin, but rather than punishing us, you punished your own son. Oh, glory be to your name, Lord. Help us get a vision of this love and help us go out of here and love people like that. And Lord, I pray for the love of Yellow Creek, Lord, that it would spread through this community and that people would look at the church and we say, well, what do you think of the church? They won't say it's money hungry or judgmental. and say, man, there ain't nobody in the world that loves like those people. They gladly give themselves away. Help us to love like that and help us to love one another. Father, as we come to invitation time, I just ask you to have your way. Whatever you want to do this morning, Lord, I pray you'll have your way. In his holy name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet with me? If you need to come this morning, I would invite you. Would you come? Would you come?